One of our challenges both in personal life and in business life now is what is for slow and what is for fast. If what I'm doing is all about outcome, then the faster the better. But if the process is important, then slowing down might be important and we've got to be able to do that. I think personal well-being is affected by that. I think we all have driven ourselves crazy with the belief that, that everything has to be fast. Welcome, David, and we are grateful to have you here today and speak about leadership. Would you start us off with a little bit about your leadership background? Thank, firstly, thanks, thanks for, for having me and for, for organizing this podcast. Wonderful to have the opportunity to, to speak to you. My background in, in this particular area of work came when I realized that, and now we're going back in nearly 30 years, that the world would be facing some interesting challenges over the then next 20 years or so, I thought. And I got together a group of CEOs and various different business leaders, a few academics. I was in South Africa at the time. South Africa itself was going through major transformation at that time. It was the end of apartheid. It was the beginning of a democratic period. So the country was changing. Society was changing. Business was changing. And looking ahead and seeing so much change ahead, I got this group together to look at what are likely to be some of the biggest challenges going forward. And how might we address them in ways that the world wasn't addressing them at that time? Uh, and we looked at a number of things. And one of the issues that came up was clearly how we were going to enable continued and, in fact, accelerated innovation and productivity without squeezing people dry, without draining people of their energy. We were going to need more and more from people. That was becoming clear. As technology became more and more of a factor in business and in production, it became clear that the role of people would change and we would be called upon to do more and more with less and less. Uh, and how do we do that with people and still keep people engaged and, and keep people inspired? Uh, and that really became the essence of it. What could we do? What element is there to, by which to increase productivity without draining people? On the contrary, and what we came to and what I developed at that time was a method of leadership that inspired people with a sense of value and purpose, and that every business can find the purpose of its existence, the higher purpose of its existence. Uh, I've always believed that people don't come together by random chance. If a group of people come together to form a business or to run a business, to manage a business, there's a reason why that particular group of people come together. And if a business is created or has evolved and developed over a period of time, it has a, a role to play in the world more than just making the widgets that it makes. It's there to do something more than that uh, for all its stakeholders, for the people it employs, for the societies it serves, for the customers it, it serves, for the investors who invest in it. It just has so much more able to be aspired to than just the making of money. And once we developed that approach and we were able to link people into that, meaning that I'm able to find my sense of purpose through working for this particular company, much as a physician or a nurse might find in, in the medical profession. It's not just a matter of doing it to earn a living. The people who work in the medical profession have a much higher sense of purpose. The same applies in business. If one can tap into that higher sense of purpose of what is this business really here to do? In what way are we here to change the world? And that aligns with my personal sense of purpose then I'm much more willing to engage and to give of myself and to apply my mind and, and to apply my feelings and emotions and energy uh, to be able to innovate and to produce. And, and that's really been the focus of the work. This is exciting, especially 20 years ago. You already began working on things that are really important right now as the world has changed and we've experienced the shutdown through COVID and a variety of things have happened and technology has boomed in the last 20 years. How does a company, so many companies are looking to move from just getting their employees to do the work and work in home separation. Somehow things are blending even more. Many people are working from home and some are in the office. How does a company begin to shift um, I know in my personal experience, we believed in productivity, and productivity meant people worked 40 hours, 60 hours, and they were dedicated to the work, so we met the bottom line. So now we've, if that's the culture that we have in a company, how do we shift 
And how do we figure out what is our motive? What is our focus? What is that vision purpose? What's important, I, I, I think, is at least two phases, maybe maybe more than that. The first is to discover this, that sense of purpose. And the other is then to pivot the company into a purpose-driven company. Just having a purpose doesn't mean that the company becomes purpose-driven. But I think the first thing is for the company to realize we don't take our eye off profits. Profits still are, are incredibly important because you can't sustain an organization if it's not profitable. So being efficient and being effective at what one is doing, whether you're running a hospital or you're running uh, a, a car manufacturing business, it doesn't matter. If it isn't going to be efficient and profitable, it isn't going to be sustainable. So that's an important part of it. But what we try and help people understand is the difference between driving your business by the numbers and measuring your business by the numbers. It's a little bit like if you're driving your car a long distance and on, on one of the freeways and you're off to see your elderly aunt whose 80th birthday it is, that's the purpose of your drive. Now you're still watching the clock, you're watching your speedometer, you're calculating what time you're going to get there. You're watching all those numbers. You're watching your, your fuel gauge. If the fuel gauge is going down, you're going to have to do something about that. Your eye is constantly on on all the different dials that tell you how you're doing. But you don't forget the reason you're, you're going, the reason that you're driving and what's motivating you and making it worthwhile for you is the visit to your elderly aunt. It's not the speed at which you're going. It's not the time that you're going to get there, but those things are just equally important. And so it is with a business. You, business leaders need to be watching the metrics all the time because if something's not right, you're going to see it in the metrics and that has to be corrected. But that isn't what, what can inspire people. People aren't inspired by balance sheets. Maybe there are a few accountants that get excited by, by balance sheets, but most people aren't inspired by numbers. They're not inspired by spreadsheets. People are inspired by the value of what they're adding and what they're bringing to the world, what they're bringing to people. When I talk about bringing to the world, it doesn't have to be changing the entire world. Sometimes a person's purpose might be something relatively small, but with big impact. So let us say, for example, you were to ask Einstein's mother what her purpose was, and she were to say, to raise my son to be the best he can possibly be. That's all I want to be doing. One wouldn't say to her, well, that's a bit of a waste of time. Can't you think of something bigger or more worthwhile to do? That did change the world. In defining our purposes, whether as individuals or as a business, it doesn't have to be to change the world in the, in the biggest kind of way. And you have visionaries who do have that kind of sense of purpose. You have an Elon Musk, and you have a Steve Jobs, and you have a Bill Gates, and these were people who did, right in the very beginning, have these very big visions of how the world could be different, and they work towards that. But most people don't have that scale of vision, and they don't need to have that scale of vision, but there needs to be a sense of, I'm doing something valuable. I'm doing something valuable for a person, or for people, or for society. Just, I'm doing something valuable for somebody other than me or a purpose uh, that, that is higher than me, uh, so that a person doesn't become self-centered and self-driven in their, in their business activities, but rather working towards something bigger and something higher. That's inspirational for people. Those are the steps. Firstly, one would have to say, you, you asked, how do we get to discovering the purpose? And there we have an interesting approach. I've always thought that purpose is not something that you create. It's not something that you design. It's there. We all have a purpose, and every group of people has a purpose. There's a, there's a purpose that, that brings them together. It's about discovering it and what that is. And to discover it, you've got to discover what makes you unique. In what way are you as an individual or your team or your company? In what way are you different from, from any other? And there you'll look at things like your capacities, what it is that you're able to do, the mix of capacities. If you take a, a, a leadership team of, an, of a business, and you figure out who are these people at the, at the essence. And I believe, I'm sure you do too, that there are no two people who are identical and there have never been. There's never been an, another you, and there's never been another me, and there never will be. As unique as we are, if three of us get together or 10 of us get together, that is something that is so unique. That is, there's nothing in the world in, that, that can come anything close to that. Now, how do we use that? How do we say these 10 people that have come together can do something that nobody else can do and try and understand what it is, what capacity do you have? What are we passionate about? What are the things that drive us? And who are the people that we're passionate about serving? Who, who are the people that we want to be serving? And can we define that? So we take companies through a process to be able to discover their purpose, not create their purpose. 
So it sounds like there is a process in place and it's just, it takes time, it takes intention, and it takes a lot of discovery and figuring out exactly what your strengths are. And you speak about the 10 or 20 folks that come together and it sounds like the strength base so the strength each person brings adds such a great value to an organization. And now that shifts me into the diverse cultures. So now we are definitely growing into having companies with folks that are online, in person, in different countries. So cultural nuances and differences that leaders need to be aware of in creating an environment where everyone's needs are met. Not saying that the leader's job is to make everyone happy, but what are some of the things that we need to be looking at now to create this environment that's rich and value-driven based on what others have to bring to the table? That's an important question. If one truly wants to be global and inclusive, then one has to set about it in a particular way, and we'll describe that in, in a moment. Uh, and one has to make that decision. Do you, do you really want to be that, or do you want to be more singular cultured? Uh, that's not the fashion today, but it's certainly easier uh, to say, look, I want to hire people like me, and I want to um, work with people that I feel very comfortable with, and that's what I want to do. And that's one kind of a business, and it has its advantages and its disadvantages. Um, but today, there's much more of a need and a desire to be culturally global. By global, I don't mean that I have an office in every country, but I mean that I have people from all over the world, and not necessarily even people geographically from all over the world, because what makes people diverse is not so much where they come from, but, but where they're going to. That's what makes people different. You could have a person that comes from Hong Kong or from China or Japan, and you could have somebody who comes from Germany or France, and you could have somebody that comes from Brazil or Canada or Mexico. And the fact that they all come from different places is, is significant, we can talk about that. But what's really important is, where are they all going? If they're all going to the same kind of place, then they're not that diverse. If they all went to the same schools, the same colleges, the same got the same kind of education, they're not really that diverse, even though they might look diverse. And, uh, I've always taught that diversity isn't about how different people look. It's about how different people see. If you've got two people that might look very similar, but they see the world very differently, that's diversity. Often, that, looking different and seeing differently will go hand in hand. Often somebody who's grown up in a village in China or a village in Africa is going to see the world very differently from somebody who grew up in New York City. There's obviously an impact in terms of where you where you come from and, and how you look. But you could have um, a, a group of people who look very different. You could have an African-American, you could have an Asian person, you could have a, a, a white American woman, and they all come from New York City, and they all went to the Ivy League schools in New York City, and they all went to similar sort of high schools and maybe even lived in similar parts of, of New York City. They're not diverse. There's only diverse about them. And yet you could have two or three white American males who are incredibly diverse, who see the world very, very differently. And I think there's this been this trend of checking the boxes of having diversity in terms of people uh, that look different. And yes, there, there's perhaps a higher chance that if I employ people that look different, that I will be employing people who see differently. But it's not taking, one can't take that for granted. And now we have to design our global company in a way that includes people who see the world differently. And what might that look like? So, for example, there are people who see the world through a lens of structure, and they need things to be clearly defined and black and white, and they need rules, and they need hierarchies, and they need strong legal systems, and, and they flourish in that kind of system. That's how they see the world. That's how they experience the world. And then on the other extreme, you have people who see the world relationally. They don't really care about all that stuff. How are we getting on? What's our connection? And what levels of trust are there between us? So the structural person might say, I don't need a high level of trust because if you step out of the structure, I'll sue you. The relational person will say, what? Sue me? Why would you ever do that? <laughs> Can we not talk this out? Can we not figure, the, figure this out? And so a, a relational person will feel, taking this example, incredibly insulted by the thought of, of uh, legal action. Structural person, that's just the way you do business. And then you have people who are ideological who see the world through a, set, a lens of purpose of why are we doing it? What is this What is this for? So if you can imagine three of these different people planning a vacation together, 
the one might start off saying, well, let's decide where, when are we going? Where are we going to? How are we getting there? What are we willing to spend? What's our budget? That would be the structural person. And the relational people will say, who's coming with us? You know, what kind of fun are we planning to have? Uh, and how are we going to optimize that? And where are the parties? And what kind of restaurants are we going to visit? And the more ideological purpose might say, let's just agree why we're doing this first. What is this for? What do we want out of this? And there are just three different ways of going about that project. But we see that in business all the time. And uh, business, certainly in the United States, is, is traditionally very structural. There's a need, if one is going to become globally inclusive, to find ways to incorporate the brilliance that the other lenses bring to solving a problem. But with it does come conflict and does come tensions. And of course, the issue of remote work and uh, adds just another layer of complexity, which we can talk about. So let's talk about the complexities that have aroused, you know, after having folks that were in our offices, they were right there. We knew exactly what they were producing. They also had connection to others. They were teams that were collaborating in person. And since then, we're now working from home, sometimes coming in, and there is also isolation, productivity to look at. How can one, now the things are somewhat stabilized, get some sense of order so we're taking care of our employees, we are also collaborating, and we're still getting that productivity? Because I can tell you my first belief was folks are going to work from home. How are we going to engage how much they're producing? And I think that really it's a mind shift. It's a belief system that we grew up with that we've been practicing to having to shift. So what are some of the ways that we can shift from that one way of being to this global cooperative respect and trust into the workplace? The first thing I think is we've got to shift from managing people's time to managing people's output. And so that's elevating people to a much higher level of respect. If I'm managing your time, I'm assuming that you don't know how to manage your own time. If I'm managing your output, then I'm simply aligning your skills and capabilities and time to, to our needs as an organization. That's, there's nothing disrespectful about that. So we need to be able to come to, the, to a point where I don't care how many hours you're working. It's irrelevant. What I care is what value are you adding? Um, and if you've developed ways, because you're smart and efficient, if you've developed ways of adding enormous value by working for an hour or two a day, it, it shouldn't bother me in, in that level. There's, there's another area where it does matter. So in terms of people working remotely, we've got to make that shift. In making that shift, we're beginning to treat people like almost an external resource, an outsourced resource, as a, almost in a consulting capacity, a provider rather than an employee. And that's important to negotiate with the employee because it's very hard to treat somebody as a core employee when they're remote. People aren't designed to be alone. People are designed to live in community. And our families are little communities, and we do well in social communities, living in the, in the areas around us. And there's, work is also a community. And we, we flourish in community. And that loneliness that you mentioned is something that is affecting people. There is the type of person, that they, the very introverted type of person, who thrives on working alone and getting on with their job and they don't want people. They don't need people. So you, you've got that type of person. But then that type of person needs to accept they really are operating as a provider, as an outsourced provider, being paid for their output, not as part of a core team. Because to be part of a core team, you've got to put something in as well. I often say to the people who favor working remotely, that's fine. I understand it works for you. And I understand that you're able to add value by working remotely and the company's able to pay you for that work that you added. But that's all good and fine. But there's another element to building a company and that's the, that's the culture and the values of the company and the energy of the company, the human energy of the company. How do you plan to contribute to that? And the truth is, if I'm remote, I can't contribute to that. And I need to understand that, that I'm opting not to contribute to that. Now, if I'm remote just because that's a choice, the, the office is, is a few miles away from our house, but I prefer to work from home, that's one kind of scenario. And we can overcome that by spending a certain amount of time in, in the office. If one is remote because we are truly a global company and I've got people and talent working around the world, 
then I've got to accept that my business model is not one of a company. Company means companionship. Uh, you can't have companionship online. If you've already got a strong connection, then I believe people can maintain that connection remotely with a little bit of, of the addition of getting together once a year or whatever. But if you don't have one, if you just joined the company, if you try to build a relationship with a new client or with a new partner or with a new friend, it's very, very difficult to do that remotely. You know, people can date remotely to a certain point, but they've got to meet each other. And I don't know what the numbers are of how many relationships end when they meet each other. It's just not what they thought it, it would be. A large number of relationships are successful. They managed to meet online, to get to a certain place online. They would never have met any other way. And they're able to then pivot and convert it to a, a real face-to-face -face relationship. And it's the same in business. If one starts in a company remotely and one stays remote and one's never really part of that company, you have to accept that you're an outsider. You actually are providing work to the company that needs to be okay for you. You're, you're your own business providing mm -hmm. value to a company and they're paying you for the value you do it in your own time in your own place. But as a leader, if I'm trying to build a company of people who all bring their uniqueness of spirit that we discussed when we were talking about purpose, and you want to discover what a company's purpose is, it's the people who are together that give a company its purpose, that, that really energize that company's purpose. So one needs a combination of people who are really at the core, who spend a lot of time together, people who are not so much at the core who spend some time together, and people who are on the periphery who already are providers and don't need to be there at all physically, and they can do it all remotely. And we have to be able to satisfy the needs of all three. Understanding that there are people who need a high sense of belonging. And there are people who need a high sense of autonomy. It's very difficult to have them both unless you are a founder, you're an entrepreneur. If you start your own business, you're autonomous and you have belonging. You hire a group of people and you hire a team and the team grows and you have a sense of belonging that here's this company you've created and you have autonomy because you're the boss, you created it, you can come and go as you like. But if you're not, if you're an employee, you've got to trade one or for the other. You want more autonomy and less belonging or more belonging and less autonomy. And those are new conversations that companies need to have with their employees. Uh, if it's going to be more autonomy, we might pay you in a different way. You know, your leave might be different. Your share options might be different. If you want a lot of belonging, then that's a different kind of contract. We have to be flexible enough to create employee contracts that are agile and are themselves diverse. You can't hire diverse people and have a standard employee contract. You can't have a, a diverse people and have a very standard fixed culture. There needs to be fluidity to be able to manage diversity. Shifting from the one size fits all to now moving to the agile changes, constant shifts that are happening in the world. So what are some of the things that you, you knew 20 years ago that the world's going to need something different? What are some of the similar challenges that we still have that we did 20 years ago? Because we really believe that things are so much different. I have a feeling that they're more of the same with different circumstances. And how can leaders, so my second full question here is leaders, what is it to lead and how can leaders continue to lead similarly or differently than they always have? What people do has changed. Uh, and I think we're on the, the verge of another wave of change in that area with, with artificial intelligence and everything that 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 entails. It's not so much about what technology can do. It's what about people now can do, which they couldn't do before, and more important things which people don't need to do anymore. And that's one of the hard things for people to adjust to. If you come to me and say, you know, the things you've given your life, well, we actually don't need it anymore. That is a terrible shock for a person, for a person's self of, of self-esteem. They are so invested in, in what they are. But we need to find ways of being able to help people through this. It's not we don't need you anymore. We need you more than ever. But we need you to bring your skills and your personality and your energy in, in a different way into a different place than you have in the past and to be able to do things that couldn't be done before. So for example, in terms of, of efficiency, we spoke earlier about that need for productivity and efficiency. Technology makes us more and more efficient. There's People aren't efficient and technology is efficient. So, so clearly, if, it, if there are matters of efficiency, that needs to be done by technology. But there are things we need to do that aren't efficient. 
And I think we, we're at a moment now in, in the evolution of life and of business where we've got to start valuing the things that are not efficient. We haven't had time for that. And it's been so important. So, so now, yes, there, there's a part that has to be efficient. That's the factory part. Let technology take care of the efficiency part. But, but when it comes to human relationships, to connections, to innovation, these are things that, that don't happen in an instant. These are things that do need time. These are things that happen slower. You, you can't make wine in an instant. There is a maturation process. If you're going to make good wine, it's going to take time. And the more efficient you try to be, the worse the wine is going to taste and the worse an experience it's going to be for the person who buys the wine. And now there are parts of the process you can make efficient by using technology. You can move your barrels around efficiently. You can fill the bottles efficiently. You can deliver the bottles to the stores efficiently. There are areas where you can do things efficiently, but you can't produce the wine efficiently in that, in that sense. You've got to be willing to slow down. And I think one of our challenges both in personal life and in business life now is what is for slow and what is for fast? What do I do? If, I'm, if what I'm doing is all about outcome, then the faster the better. But if the process is important, then slowing down might be important, and we've got to be able to do that. And I, I think personal well-being is affected by that. I think we all ha have driven ourselves crazy with the belief that, that everything has to be fast. And the inability, it's an incredibly hard thing to do, to live in the fast lane in one part of our lives and simultaneously in a slower lane in another part of our lives. But the, the metaphor that I use for that is, is a spinning wheel. So if you, a wheel might be spinning at such a speed that the outer periphery of the of the wheel is spinning at a, at a massive rate, but as you move closer to the core of the wheel, it, it's slower and slower. And theoretically, if you get to the very, very core, it's not moving at all, and yet it's all one wheel. And our lives are like that. Our lives are spinning, and they need to spin because that's how we get balance. But we need to know when we're living at the edge and we're spinning really fast and when we come back to the center. And we need to know how to center ourselves. People use the phrase a lot, it's that being centered, centering yourself. What does that mean? How do you do it? That's becoming increasingly important. And for a business, there are times when a business has to slow down and do some thinking and just experience things. A business is an organism as well, just as any other organism. There are times it needs to slow down. And the art is to know when to speed up and when to slow down. So as leaders, uh, being an architect or being the beacon, hard, sort of knowing when to sort of doing the hovering approach and getting into it. So that brings a topic of trust. Trust, hiring, and as a leader, first of all, what does leadership mean in a small business, large business? And who are leaders in a company? And how do we create this environment where each person has autonomy over their work and the leaders are able to support them while also allow them to do their job, the teams that they've hired? The leadership I've always defined as, as any situation. It's about a situation, not about a person. I don't believe there are leaders and non-leaders. I think at any moment in life, you are leading or you are following. And leadership is any situation where you are needing to inspire another person or people to change their thoughts, their actions, or their attitudes when there's a need to do that. So when you're selling, you're leading. Uh, when you're teaching, you're leading. In a conversation, the leadership role switches uh, in seconds from one person to the other. One person is leading, one person is following, and it switches. So it's a dance uh, with one partner taking the lead and the other following and then being able to switch. That's what leadership is, being able to be attuned to the fact that I'm now in a leadership moment, and therefore I've got to use those skills of leadership. And I use the word inspire because that's what leadership is. Leadership is not compelling change. Hitler was not a good leader. And the reason he wasn't a good leader is not because he didn't get people to follow him. Sure, he got people to, get, to follow him magnificently, better than any modern leader we know. But he did it through fear. That's not leadership. That's bullying. Leadership is to be able to inspire people to change and to do it to be able to do it not through fear and, and that that's something important again in our lives in general and in our in our work lives how do i inspire another person to want to do things differently to want to think differently uh, to want to act and behave in a way that is differently um, I, I think at the moment and in, in, in the world as it is at the moment we, we're dealing with that with a lot of bullying and, and noise and shouting instead of 
being able to share ideas, disagree, and and try to inspire others to see things the way we do or not, and and just respect people for seeing things differently. That respect of diversity, and that again doesn't just mean respect of people who look different, but people who are different in the way they see the world and the way they function, the way they work. That that respect is a foundation of trust. Trust is not is not to be confused with reliability. People say that if you do what you say enough times, people learn to trust you. No, they learn to rely on you. Trust is different. Trust is you meet somebody you've never met before, and you say to yourself, I would trust my life with this person. I would, I, I would let this person babysit my children. How do you know? Uh, and sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we trust people and we find we were wrong. But it's a decision we make in an instant. It's a, it's a flow of energy that you feel, this is somebody I can trust. This person might not be 100% reliable, but that's not what trust means. Reliability is one value, and it's an important value. And trust is something else. Trust is feeling that the other person is able to have my interests or to put my interests first, that the person has that capacity. Whether they do put my interests first or not, that's the second part of the conversation. But to feel that the person has that capacity, that's the decision we make really quickly. When you you walk into a store and you're about to buy something or you're about to buy a house from a, a real estate person, or you make a very quick decision, do I think this person has the capacity to put my interests first? And if the answer is no, then at least I know where I stand. I don't trust this person. It doesn't mean I don't deal with them, I don't work with them, but it's not in the, the realm of trust. That ability it becomes so important in leadership because what I've got to be able to do is inspire trust. I've got to be able to give people the sense that I have the capacity and the will to put their interests first. And that's something that I would actually do. And then you have a, a collaborative world because if you and I are working together and we know that each of us will put the other's interests first, we don't have to watch our backs. We, we can now move forward and do exciting things knowing that we don't have to watch our backs. And it's just a very beautiful environment in which to operate. We often don't realize how much energy and power is released by projecting trust, by being trustworthy. And being trustworthy means I inspire in other people the sense that I'm able to put others before myself. I'm able to put a purpose before myself. I'm able to put myself second. Those are the 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 really shocking leaders are the ones who you feel put themselves first. And this genuine interest, it sounds like the leaders have in their people when there is trust that's, I am here to inspire, I'm here and I trust you. And if we make a mistake or when we get off track, we'll together figure it out in that faith. Now, leaders are often thinking, well, we can just have environments where folks can do things on their own and we're moving and we're growing. And that's really valuable as well. But what is processes, procedures? Does it still have the same role as it did 20 years ago? What is the employee's guiding light on how we function, in your opinion? I think Yogi, that will differ from industry to industry. The, the industries where, where process is, is absolutely paramount. If a pilot is flying a plane that I'm a passenger in, I would want to know that he's following the process. Um, but I would also want to know that he has the capacity to make a decision to override the process. And that's where trust comes in. It was quite interesting. I don't know if you remember the early days of the of the Airbus and there were some bad, bad uh, accidents at the time, there were bad crashes at the time. But what was interesting, it was such a very different philosophy between at that time Boeing and Airbus. Um, Airbus was trying to create a an aircraft that it didn't need you. The, the, the opportunity for human er error was, was minimal. And that was fine when things went well. But when things weren't going well, it was almost impossible for the pilot to override the system. And sometimes it was because the system is so powerful and sometimes because the pilot had become so reliant on the system that that muscle was not, was not well developed. And Boeing had a very different philosophy at the time. I'm sure now things have merged and there's not that much difference between them. I'm not sure. But those two models that on the one hand, the, you, there are certain industries where you really want process to be paramount and there's certain interests where process is there just to support and to help. But in all cases, you don't want the person to lose their humanity. The, the danger with artificial intelligence is not the machines and the robots. 
I'm not scared of them. I'm scared of the, the people who have become robots. That's m- much more damaging. That I, as a person, have to use process as a tool. That's really important. And the, and the better the process and the finer the process and the more efficient the process, the better it is. But when I just become a factor in that process and not master of the process, uh, that's when I start to lose my humanity. I remember once in the days where one could go into the cockpit of a plane, taking my daughter into the cockpit and uh, talking to the pilot, and I'm asking him about an island down that we saw through the window. And he wasn't sure what it was or where it was. And he just said, I don't need to know what, what that is or where that is. I can tell you to the second what time we're going to land and to the meter, I can tell you where we're going to land. The rest of it, the machines take care of. That I found troubling hmm. in, in a sense, that the, that the process is so dominated by technology that the human element is actually extracted from it completely. So I think we have to, as leaders, we have to look at that and say, what is the role of the human element and how do we redefine the human element? So ChatGPT can write my articles now. Does that mean that I abdicate the article writing to ChatGPT? Or does my role become a different one, a more creative one, since ChatGPT can now check my grammar and all of that stuff? Do I put most of my effort now into innovative content? And how do I push the boundaries there in ways I didn't have time to do before because I'd spend so much time on on the grammar, which now can be done quickly, for example. So earlier you spoke about the change and the new wave and, you know, in the future, things are going to be considered with technology or with AI. What are some of the things that you notice that we need to prepare for or we need to be aware of, especially with social interest? Social interest not relying solely on technology versus our communities, creating strengths within our employees, teams, and having some of that, the wheel in the center and the wheel on the outside um, analogy you use. So what do you forecast? What do you know? What should we consider? And what should leaders now start to review and focus on as we move into this AI? It's, it's here. And we need to just adapt and figure out how we're going to use this technology. I mean, we have to embrace it. We're, this is where we're going. And I'd love to hear your ideas about that. So let's stay with the aircraft analogy for a moment. So now my pilot friend is sitting in the cockpit. He's bo- as bored as anything. Uh, he's taken off. He's got a long flight. He's set the flight path. He's got to check things. He's got to listen in to, to what's happening around. But, but basically, it's robotic. I don't know what the pilots do with their time and, and, and how they spend their time. I'm sure there are things for them to attend to, but not to use the fullness of who they are as people and the training and the, uh, and the intellect that they have as, as, as human beings. How would it be if the pilot said, well, I don't need to fly the plane anymore because the robots are doing that better than I could do it. Uh, and I've got the co-pilot here who's, who's taking care of things. Let me go and talk to the passengers. And the pilot walked through the plane and stopped and spoke to, to people and explained things to them and noticed that somebody was nervous and helped them and spoke about the company and why our company is amazing and, and, and what we do. So he would now be doing things that weren't in his job, aren't in his job re- really at all, but he's free to do those things. He could be building connections with passengers in such a way that I can't come off that plane and say to myself, I'll never fly on another airline. I had no idea that they're so thoughtful, that they're so caring, because there was a connection between a senior person on the on the flight. He has the time to do that. Why doesn't he do that? Because it's not his job. So we, we've categorized him. We're turning him into a robot. Instead of saying, my goodness, we've unleashed the power of a human being who's sitting idle for an eight-hour flight when he could really be marketing our company. He could be creating connections with people in a magnificent way. And I think that applies to, to everything we do. How can I use technology to do the things I don't need to do? I think Yogi one has to be inherently lazy. I think there's an enormous value in laziness. And, and by laziness, I mean, I take myself an example. If I can find something that somebody else can do better than me or as well as me or almost as good as me, I really don't want to be doing that thing. Why would I want to spend my time when there's somebody else who could do it, do it better? So I'm just so ready to to delegate, whether it's to machines or to other people. There's a certain delight in me in getting rid of monotonous work. But where the laziness ends is I don't then say, well, now I can go and lie on the couch. The the question is, and now I've got a whole lot of time and capacity freed up. What can I do that nobody else can do? 
And if we would adopt that mindset, I think we would be on the verge of such innovation, not just in the area of robotics, but we would find cures to diseases. We would find new ways to educate people. And, and these areas aren't, aren't changing that far. Take the school system. It's 100 years or more old. It hasn't been updated forever. And, and yes, so now you plug some iPads into and you're doing the same old stuff with some new technology. But we haven't yet adjusted to the fact that students don't need information anymore. So now the school teacher has to say, if, if my student doesn't need me for information, because they have access to better teachers than me. They can plug into the best teachers in the world in my, in my subject. Uh, they don't need me for that. So now comes a very difficult, soul-searching purpose question, because you're repurposing. So what is my purpose? It's no longer to give the student information. My purpose is now to inspire the student's curiosity. How do I go about it? And I imagine if all the teachers in the classrooms were doing that, instead of dishing out this information which the students are able to get much more efficiently, in, in all these areas, I think we've got to say to ourselves, what can I delegate to machines and, and celebrate that? Just be so relieved that that can be delegated. But now, how do I do something that machines and even other people can't do as well? Now, take that area of writing. Are we losing the whole capacity to write? And, and writing as a process of developing self, not just of producing an out, output, but of self-development, being able to journal, being able to write a piece, to be able to translate one's thought processes into writing. Are we losing that capacity? How do I make sure that I don't, that I keep that, but, but still use technology to be able to do it more effectively and more efficiently? So whereabouts are you living? Are you in New York? Are you abroad right now? I'm living in a very um, hot spot at the moment. I'm living in Israel, so I'm right in the in the Middle East, and and as you know, it's uh, an incredibly uh, intense. It, it always it always has been intense. It is an intense society. It's an intense place, and the issues the country is faced with, and the region is faced with, are issues that that um, appear to be almost insoluble. So, living in a, an environment dealing with challenges that appear to be insoluble offer opportunities for amazing people to think and act in amazing ways. We're not yet seeing the fullness of that. We're not yet experiencing that. But that, these are areas. No no structure and no technology is going to solve the problems of the Middle East. It's going to have to be solved by human beings, uh, human beings who are able to build trust, human beings who are able to inspire one another. It's one of these areas where I'm really watching leadership and leadership failure hour by hour, never mind day by day or week by week, ordinary people doing amazing things, amazing acts of leadership, and leaders doing things that are incredibly dumb, and, and just realizing how tenuous the, the art of leadership really is and, and how fragile it is. Thank you for sharing, David. And yes, indeed, being from outside, we can sense the chaos, the challenges that folks may be experiencing. What types of leadership so this is just one example that you shared, which is really tragic. In the world, in the companies, we tend to have minor challenges or we've, we're facing reality of severe challenges. What are some of the qualities that are really important when there are devastating challenges or, you know, in a company, it might be profitability, you know, we might have to close down, we can't find employees. What are some of the strengths that leaders need to incorporate when there is severe challenge? Because it's easy to get into that fear mode and operate from the fear mode, which is more rules, more challenges, more power, um, you know, more control. But there is that opposite, which is then most important. Can you speak a little bit to that? So, yeah, I think it's about a person having a... Um a mindset of an element of the infinite, that anything is possible, that there is not a, a limited pie that has to be that has to be shared out. We're living in, in a world, in a universe that is capable of of enormous production, believing in people, that we that people can turn themselves around and people can turn a business around, being willing to to face discomfort and, and pain. Uh, I think if we're trying to so as you talked earlier about pleasing people, and we're always going to try and find the easy way for ourselves or for others, we're going to miss the opportunities to to grow. So to accept and embrace the struggles of growth, 
and to be able to take a, a bigger picture and have a, a North Star ability to say, am I doing the right thing? Am I doing the right thing in terms of my values and my beliefs? We're living in a very noisy world, and the noise is coming at us from all directions in all sorts of different platforms. It's coming to us in the form of people who are very confident that they have the answer to everything and they have the, 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 the right view of everything. And we have to be able to check in with ourselves. What is my belief system? And and am I doing the right thing? Being able to take a, a, a sometimes a, to zoom out a little bit and say, not only am I doing the right thing in this narrow area, but am I doing the right thing in a bigger area? Uh, and to realize that stakeholders ha- have opposite interests very often. It's very, very difficult for a business leader. It's okay when things are good and, and I can pay good dividends to my investors and I can increase salaries for my employees and I can increase prices to customers and nobody cares because there's plenty of money around. And we've come from that environment where money has been very abundant and cheap. And leaders who grew up in that environment are finding it very hard to adjust to an environment where money is expensive and where you have to make trade-offs. And that's where the leadership decisions have to be made. I've got to make a trade-off. I'm either going to pay the employees more or I'm going to be able to deliver returns to the investors. I can't do both. Which is the right thing for me to do? And right means morally and ethically right, and right from a business perspective as well. And being able to to navigate the complexity of of rightness. I think today altogether, we're talking about some of the, the political battles that are taking place today. I think it's much easier if we just ask ourselves, not am I conservative or liberal, or do I favor the Palestinians or the Israelis, or uh, am I pro-Russia or, 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 or pro-Ukraine? That gets very complicated. The first thing to, to clarify with oneself is, do I know the difference between right and wrong? Do I know the difference between good and bad? And I'm, am I willing to take a side for good? And that means there are times when I might be on one person's side, and there are times when that person does something terribly wrong, and I will not be on their side for that. It's not an alliance. It's a, it's a moral choice that needs to be made in the way we judge the actions of, of others. It's only our family that we love unconditionally. And even there, there t- come times where it's not unconditioned, where, where a person might do something that shatters the love. And, and certainly when it comes to the world and to a business with stakeholders, am I willing to do that which is right no matter how uncomfortable it is? Or do I want to just find the most comfortable path and wing my way through? I think those are the people who are finding it hardest. The people who have moral clarity are finding it easier to, to navigate complexity and confusion, because we're dealing with complexity and confusion, and there's no black and white answer out there. It has to be black and white for me, and and that might be different for you, and that's okay, uh, as long as I know that, that you're honest and integrous to who you are and me to who I am, we can then have a conversation about it and understand that we see the world differently. It, it's when we don't know the difference between right and wrong and good and bad that we get into really shady areas. That high integrity to self and accepting the integrity, whatever that might be for the other person, that's again a navigation and communication. And I have a, while you were sharing, there is a story that I have in mind. It's when I had visited India and there was a company that builds portable homes or buildings and they had tons of people working for them. There were about 5,000 employees. And there was manual things that were happening. You know, they were carrying things from one area to another manually. And of course, the suggestion was, why wouldn't you innovate? You know, you, we have equipment uh, movers, you know, like we have other means to do this work. And they said, we choose this because we have tons of people that live in this world. And it's our moral responsibility to offer employment. And should we bring machinery, these folks will not have the means to feed their family. And it is our social responsibility, not only to make profit, but to take care of the communities around us. They knew what their purpose was. Definitely, they made money. They took care of their people. So there is an opportunity to and both. And yes. not saying that every company needs to go out there and not inno- not to innovate. However, you're speaking about this balance that we have to remember 
in order to not just be a leader of a company, but the communities around us. And I think if we all do that, I can, and you spoke about it, we can definitely innovate. We can change the systems that are not working rather than to stay within them. Like school systems is one of the areas that I'm speaking of currently is when you have the board, you have the teachers and you have the administration and the administrators often hold in the directions of the state's changes on what the curriculums are, but we're forgetting who are this changes for? What is the bottom line? Who are we serving? Who's our customer? It's the child, the student. So what is the best for us to do for them? And I think if we just sort of align to the purpose and how could we could innovate the way we do things, we can really, and, and this conversation was very inspiring for me, um, in the last minutes, what are some of the things that you can share with those who are leading and they have boards and they have, they're in the middle? And definitely sometimes these leaders are reporting to the board and they still have the employees and constantly the ships. How can the leader lead with their integrity and maintain the expectations of the board, but really meet the needs of their people? I think you, you touched on, on, on a word, and that, that really is the foundation of purpose, and that is for each person to decide, who am I serving? We're all serving someone in every area of our lives or something. And to clarify that, to get very, very absolutely crystal clear on, on who I'm serving. So for example, in a business, I'm serving the customer, let us say. I, I make that choice. I'm here to serve the customer. I'm here to support employees. Now, you might have another business that says, I'm here to serve my employees. And, and customers are the vehicle. By having customers, we make enough money to be able to pay the employees. But that's a decision I have to make as a leader. Am I here to serve employees and customers are a vehicle? Or am I here to serve customers and I support my employees in that activity? And when it comes to shareholders, I don't serve my shareholders. I reward my shareholders. They've taken a chance on me. I reward them. So we have these different relationships. We get confused when we think, I serve all of them. How do I serve all of them? What do, how do I do that? No, I serve one of them. It's my choice as to who it is that I want to serve. We all serve somebody. Some of us serve ourselves. Uh, and We become self-serving. You need to acknowledge that. I'm here to serve myself. I, I'm first in this. Then just acknowledge that. Just clarity on, on who I'm here to serve. So in the, in the school system that you're talking about too, where it's a, it can be such a struggle, there should be no question, I'm here to serve the next generation of leaders. That's who I'm here to serve. Not even the students in front of me. I'm here to serve the next generation. How well am I doing that? I report to a board. That's not the same as serving a board. I do, I do not serve you. I have to be able to get up and say to the board, I do not serve you. I report to you. These are the people I serve. To be able to say to the parents of the, of, of the, of the students sometimes, I don't serve you. I need your support. And I, I can help you and support you in many different ways, but my my service is to the next generation of of leaders, to the next generation of of, of people. That's that's where I'm going to make the difference. Uh, so I think if the, if one becomes very clear on who one serves and what the nature of one's relationship is with the other competing stakeholders, it becomes easier to get that north star sense of doing the right thing. Am I doing the right thing for the next generation of leaders? Thank you, David, for speaking with us today. You're listening to Jagged Edge Podcast with Yogi Patel. If you like the content of this podcast, please follow and join us for another session. And David, thank you for encouraging us, inspiring us as leaders, as human beings, and your wisdom. I hope to speak to you again and have different conversations. I look forward to that. Thank you very much for having me, Yogi. If you like the content of this video, please don't forget to follow. And also, if you want more information, visit the website yogipatelttte.com.